In this video, I want to provide an introduction to the gamma distribution. So what we're going to talk about here is we're first of all going to define what is exactly meant by the gamma distribution. Then importantly, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about why might we use the gamma distribution and we're going to explain some sort of the examples which sort of might be appropriate to model using a gamma distribution, particularly looking at sort of Bayesian inference here. Then what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and we're going to look at some sort of intuition as to how the gamma distribution works in terms of its two parameters. So we're actually going to look at graphs of the PDF in this particular example. And we're going to see how those graphs or those PDFs vary as we vary the parameters. Finally, we're going to go ahead and we're going to derive the mean of a gamma distribution, which is actually fairly simple to do if you use one small trick. So starting off with defining the gamma distribution, we say that y is distributed as a gamma random variable with parameters alpha and beta if it has a corresponding PDF, which is the probability of y given alpha and beta, as being equal to beta to the power alpha divided through by gamma of alpha. So this is now a sort of gamma function here, which is the continuous analog of the factorial function, times y to the power alpha minus 1 times e to the power minus beta times y. And firstly, we should say that this distribution, quite obviously, is a continuous distribution. And secondly, we should say that it's only defined for y being greater than or equal to zero. Also, we assume that the parameters alpha and beta are both bigger than zero. Okay, so that's the mathematical definition of a gamma distribution. Let's now talk about why we might use a gamma distribution, particularly in reference to Bayesian inference. So let's think about some examples of sort of parameters or situations which we might model using a gamma distribution. Well, seeing as y is always greater than or equal to zero, we might model y as some sort of mean measure of a count variable. And we're saying here a sort of a mean measure because remember that because it's a mean it can actually take on a non-integer value. So particularly I'm thinking here of when you might use a gamma prior as a prior for the parameter lambda of a Poisson distribution. So here we would say as a prior lambda is gamma distributed with parameters alpha and beta. And just to be absolutely clear it's appropriate to model lambda as a gamma distribution because the gamma distribution is only defined in this circumstance for lambda being greater than or equal to zero. So that's okay. That's exactly what we would expect a sort of mean count variable to have in terms of its characteristics. Another type of situation whereby we might use a gamma distribution in Bayesian inference is if we are specifying a prior for a precision parameter. So precision is equal to 1 over the variance, and often we think in terms of precision rather than in variances. And it turns out that in this circumstance, the gamma distribution is a relatively good distribution to use because of its conjugate properties for modeling the precision. And the precision, again, is a parameter which is always greater than or equal to zero. So the fact that our distribution is only defined for positive values makes sense in terms of a prior for precision. Okay, so let's now talk about some of the intuition behind the graphs of the PDF as we vary the parameters alpha and beta. And let's start off by considering the example where alpha is actually equal to 1. In that circumstance, we can write down the formula for the gamma distribution. So now we've got the probability of y, given that alpha is equal to 1 and given beta, is just in this circumstance, what I'm going to do is I'm going to forget about these sort of normalizing constants here, because these constants here aren't a function of the variable, they're not a function of y, so I'm just going to forget about them at first. And when alpha is equal to 1, 
this first part here, y to the power alpha minus 1, is actually y to the power 0. So that's just 1 and that disappears. And our gamma distribution just sort of goes as e to the power minus beta times y. So if we were to draw this distribution now, we could imagine that it's just basically going to be, if we were to sort of draw the PDF, it's just going to be an exponential decay. So it's just going to sort of peak at 0 and it's just going to decay exponentially with a rate of sort of beta here. So this is the circumstance where alpha is equal to 1. Let's now think about what would happen if we increased alpha to being equal to 2. Now we've got the, the probability density, the probability of y, given alpha is equal to 2 and given beta, now goes as, well now we've just got y to the power alpha is 2, so alpha minus 1 is 1, so it's just y times e to the power minus beta y. And now we can see that basically as y increases, there is a differential effect of both of these terms. As y increases, this first term acts to increase. So that acts to increase the PDF, whereas as y increases, this second term here actually decreases. And because generally exponentials beat sort of powers, we know that this sort of second term is going to dominate when y is quite big, and perhaps this first term will dominate when y is small. And what that actually means is that our PDF for the case of alpha being equal to 2 is going to look something like this. And initially what happens is y is dominating and then the beta y starts to take over and then there is this sort of exponential decay afterwards which corresponds to the second term really dominating and taking it towards 0 as we go to infinity. So this is the circumstance when alpha is equal to 2. And we can imagine if we were to change this to alpha being equal to 3, what we would then have is we would have a y squared here. And you can imagine that y squared is going to increase faster than y, and eventually it's going to lose out to the second term, but at least in the short run it's going to do better than the alpha equals 2 case. So what we can do is we can draw the PDF for this sort of third example here, and it might look something like this blue line which I'm drawing here, perhaps a bit smoother than that which I've drawn here. But the point is that it sort of peaks uh, at some point which is after the alpha equals 2 mark. Now what we can do is we can think about the effect of changing beta in our distribution. And for the effect of changing beta, what I'm going to do is I'm going to think about the probability of y given sort of alpha and beta as being given by something which is beta to the power alpha times y to the power alpha minus 1 times e to the power minus beta y. And actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to forget about this sort of first or this sort of middle term here because I'm keeping alpha the same. So let's just forget about that term and all we've got here is a sort of beta to the power alpha times e to the power minus beta times lambda. So here you can see the effect of increasing beta. As you increase beta there is sort of two effects. One of the effects is via this first term, and this sort of governs the height which our distribution sort of reaches. And as you increase beta, that's obviously going to increase the height of our PDF. But the second term here means that as I increase beta, the sort of rate at which we decay towards zero is that much faster. So this actually acts to sort of decrease the distribution, particularly after we have reached its maximum. And so what it's actually going to do is it's going to make the distribution that much sharper. So as I increase beta, it's going to become taller and it's going to become sharper. So you can imagine for the case of when sort of these were all sort of drawn for the case of when beta was equal to 1, say. As I increase beta, you can imagine that the alpha equals 3 case will increase upwards. And perhaps what will happen is it will look something more like this line which I'm drawing here. So this might be the alpha, sorry, the beta equals 2 case when alpha is equal to 3, and as I said, beta is now equal to 2. So now the distribution's become higher, but the rate of it sort of declining towards 0 is that much faster. It doesn't take long now for the distribution to get very, very close to 0 as I increase y. So the distribution's actually become taller and it's become sharper. But I don't want you to take my word for this, so what I've actually gone ahead and done is I've coded this up into MATLAB.
And so now what we're doing is we're starting off with the circumstance of when alpha and beta are both equal to 1, and we know from our sort of preceding analysis that the gamma distribution should just look like an exponential decline for that circumstance. So if I run this, we see exactly that. We see that the gamma distribution in this circumstance is just an exponential decline. As I increase alpha to 2, we should imagine that we're going to start to see this sort of hump shape because now we've got these sort of two contrasting effects that are, fight, are sort of fighting against each other as y increases. So if I increase that to 2, we see that the distribution now has this sort of hump structure. And as I increase alpha more towards 3, we're going to see a shifting out of this hump more towards the sort of centre of our graph as we see it here. So if we run this, it's moving out that bit more. If I increase alpha that much more up to, let's say, 6, it's going to increase a lot. So it's going to sort of, the point at which it reaches a maximum is going to be that much further to the right, and it's going to take that much longer for the exponential component of it to take the distribution towards zero. Now, if we start off with a sort of case of alpha being equal to 3 and beta being equal to 1, and then we start to vary beta, we start off with this distribution when beta is equal to 1, as I increase beta to 2, remember what we expect to see, we expect that the distribution is going to become taller, but it's going to become that much sharper as well. So the distribution is going to go to 0 after the maximum that much quicker. So if we run this, we see exactly that. The distribution is both taller and it is taking that much less time to go towards 0 as I increase y. As I increase beta that much more, we can see here that we're going to sort of get a little bit higher and the distribution is going to come sharper still. So you can see here quite easily the effect of changing alpha and beta. Now what I want to do is I want to work out the mean of a gamma distribution. And to do so, I'm going to now move to a new clean canvas. So I'm going to start out by writing out the PDF for this example. So just so that we have it at the top, the probability of y given alpha and beta is just equal to beta to the power alpha, all divided through by the gamma function of alpha, times y to the power alpha minus 1, times e to the power minus beta times y. And remember that this distribution is only defined for y being greater than or equal to 0. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to work out the mean of a gamma distribution. So essentially what we're trying to work out here is we're trying to work out the expectation of y. And we know that this in the continuous PDF example is just found by integrating over all values of y that are allowed, so here from naught to infinity, of y times this PDF. So that's just y times beta to the power alpha divided through by gamma of alpha times y to the power alpha minus 1 times e to the power minus beta times y integrated over y. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take out actually this sort of constant here and that's just going to have a factor of beta to the power alpha over gamma of alpha outside the front of this integral because it doesn't contain any y terms. So now I'm integrating from naught to infinity well, I've got y times y to the power alpha minus 1, so y to the 1 times y to the alpha minus 1, which is just going to give me a y to the power alpha, times the exponent of minus beta y integrated over choice of y. And what I could do is I could go ahead and I could do some sort of integration by parts iteratively, and that would allow me to work out this rather difficult integral. But it turns out you don't actually need to do this, because there is a bit of a trick that we can use here. Essentially, apart from the normalizing constant, this term inside the sort of integral is a gamma sort of distribution with a parameter alpha plus 1 and its second parameter still equal to beta. The only difference, as I say, is the fact that we haven't got this sort of normalizing sort of constant out in front of it. But what we can actually do is we can sort of write that normalizing constant in front of it within the integral. So then what we have is e to the power alpha divided through by gamma of alpha, then I'm going to leave a bit of space, times the integral from 0 to infinity of, now we're going to, what I'm going to put here is beta to the power alpha plus 1 divided through by the gamma function of alpha plus 1 times y to the power alpha times e to the power minus beta y integrated over choice of y. 
But obviously I've just introduced this constant term here, so I have to divide through that, which is equivalent to multiplying through by 1 over that. So that's just multiplied through by gamma of alpha plus 1, divided through by beta to the power alpha plus 1, and then we've got this equality now holding. So why have I actually done that? Well, the reason I've done that is because now this term that I'm sort of underlining, this integral now, is just an integral over a gamma density. And we know that a gamma density is a probability distribution. So this integral has to equal 1. So we can just forget about this whole sort of integral term here, and we're just left with this sort of term that we have on the left here just involving these constants. And we can simplify these readily enough. Remember that the gamma function of a sort of parameter n is actually the continuous analog of the factorial distribution. And actually, if we just confine ourselves to the circumstance of when we're talking about sort of integers here, the gamma function of n is equal to n minus 1 factorial. So we can actually use the simplification when we're just talking about alpha being an integer. So when we sort of consider alpha to be an integer, we can rewrite this whole thing as beta to the power alpha divided through by beta to the power alpha plus 1. On the top, it just becomes alpha factorial. And on the bottom, we have alpha minus 1 factorial. Then what we can do is we can simplify the first part, which is the part with the betas in it. And we've just got a beta to the power alpha divided through by the beta to the power alpha times beta. So this whole sort of first term here just becomes 1 over beta. And the second term is actually quite easy to simplify as well. When we consider the fact that alpha factorial is just alpha times, you know, alpha minus 1, etc. And alpha minus 1 factorial is just equal to alpha minus 1 times, you know, alpha minus 2, etc. So they're both exactly the same after this first A. So the whole of this sort of second part is going to cancel between the two of these things here. And we're just going to be left with alpha factorial over alpha minus 1 factorial, just yielding alpha. And hence, we get that the mean of this distribution is just given by alpha over beta. And as it turns out, this actually holds for non-integer alpha as well.